Hello, thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm John Allen, Dr. Allen. I'm here at Weill Cornell Medicine, and, and like I said, thank you for joining me for this Velocity vlog, where we're gonna highlight some new treatments and, and some recent publications, as well as recent presentations at some of the major conferences, highlighting a few novel agents, as well as uh, some novel combinations, and, and uh, trying to highlight how we might be using these drugs moving forward into the future. Uh, we'll, we'll highlight on four studies. The first study uh, that I'll talk about is a recent publication, Lancet Hematology by Burris et al., uh, talking about the phase one results from a drug called umbrilisib. Umbrilisib is a novel PI3 kinase uh, that is unique from other PI3 kinases in that uh, its molecular structure is different. Uh, it's a different backbone than uh, the previous uh, FDA-approved uh, PI3 kinases, such as idelalisib. And it has a unique property in that it also inhibits a protein called CK1, or casein kinase epsilon 1. And it is this potential inhibition that they think there might be um, differential in activity as well as potential differential in toxicities. Uh, casein kinase 1 epsilon is uh, um, implicated in regulation of MYC, BCL2, cyclin D1, as well as uh, potential in regulating some inflammatory um, uh, accesses. So I'll, I'll start out talking about this study. This was a phase one dose escalation study. This is the first publication actually outside of, uh, you know, presenta uh, presented abstracts. Um, demonstrating the uh, safety, efficacy, and uh, of this drug as a monotherapy. So uh, this was a phase one study. This was a classic phase one study, a three plus three dose escalation scheme, uh, where they the primary endpoint of the study was to establish a maximum tolerated dose, uh, the safety of the drug, as well as understand some of the pharmacokinetics behind the drug. The secondary endpoints were to look at overall response rates and the duration of response in the patients. And as I said before, it's a standard 3 plus 3 design uh, where they started at 50 milligrams, which was a, is a small dose, and went all the way up to 1,800 milligrams in the different cohorts. And what they found, uh, so they enrolled 90 patients, and this enrolled 90 patients with relapse refractory hematologic malignancies, anywhere from T-cells to B-cells, CLL, follicular lymphoma, other indolent lymphomas, and uh, enrolled these 90 patients in this dose escalation scheme and evaluated those endpoints as I spoke about. And what they found, and, and in this study, of those 90 patients, 27% uh, of them had CLL, and the vast majority had other indolent uh, uh, malignancies. And what they found was that the maximum tolerated dose was at 1,200 milligrams. And then the recommended phase two dose, which is where all of the response rates were started to be seen, uh, was at 800 milligrams. And so all patients going forward in all of the other clinical trials that are currently being performed are using an 800 milligram dose of umbrilisib. So what they found is that the drug was safe and uh, safe and effective and actually had different toxicities than that previously seen uh, uh, with, um, with other PI3 kinases that currently being used. The most common adverse events were diarrhea with 43% of patients experiencing that. Most of these were grade one, which resolved without intervention. Uh, secondarily, patients, 42% uh, of patients had nausea uh, and 31% of patients experienced fatigue, most of which, again, were grade one and two. The most common grade three and four adverse events uh, were typically related to and restricted to hematologic abnormalities, with about 13% of patients experiencing neutropenia, about 9% of patients experiencing anemia, and 7% of patients experiencing grade uh, three or four thrombocytopenia. Uh, interesting, they, they, they saw a relatively low grade uh, amount of uh, a, uh, liver function abnormalities uh, with about 3% having a grade 3 or 4. Usually these uh, resolved upon holding the drug, uh, but in a few patients it did recur. Um, the SAEs that were of interest that were reported in the study were pneumonia and colitis in 3 and 2% of patients respectively 
And importantly to note, uh, the colitis that was seen, which is commonly seen at relatively high rates with PI3 kinase inhibitors, was seen at high, doses higher than the recommended phase two dose of 800 milligrams. And at that dose, no actual colitis was seen. Um, importantly, umrilisib was clinically active with 62% overall response rate uh, in all of the patients. And all of these responses were at the 800 milligram dose or higher. In CLL, they noted in, of the CLL patients, when they looked at those patients alone, 85% uh, overall response rate and 75% overall response rates in patients with high-risk cytogenetics, such as complex karyotype, deletion 17P, or 11Q. And in the post hoc analysis, in that cohort of patients, uh, they noted a median PFS of 24 months. And so these were relapsed refractory high-risk patients, and uh, that was an impressive progression-free survival uh, for a monotherapy. So this study really highlights uh, the uh, potential of this new drug uh, to be used. Uh, importantly, the side effect profile, which was different than other PI3 kinases that are currently being used. It's a, it seems to be an exciting new drug um, that has uh, some potential and is currently being studied in other phase three studies as well as other phase two studies in combinations with other novel agents in patients with CLL and other malignancies. Um, and so we look forward to how this will occur and come out. Um, and, and one other just last point that only 10% of these patients actually stopped, uh, stopped this drug due to adverse events, whereas that is un unusual for other PI3 kinases. So we look forward to the future of, of seeing how this drug pans out and uh, if other patients are going to be able to uh, get access to it in the near future. So the next study that I'd like to talk about is uh, a randomized phase three study that was presented at last year at ASH in December by Jeff Sharman. Uh, this is a study highlighting a new novel anti-CD20 uh, antibody called ublituximab. And this is a phase three study called Genuine, uh, which is a combination study uh, with ibrutinib versus ibrutinib monotherapy. So it's ublituximab plus ibrutinib versus ibrutinib monotherapy. As I said previously, it was presented at ASH 2017. Uh, to give some background and context to what ublituximab is, uh, ublituximab is a uh, glycoengineered anti-CD20 with enhanced antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, much in the vein of obinutuzumab. Um, and we know that obinutuzumab in a phase three study has been proven to be better than rituximab, which is not a, a glycoengineered antibody in terms of progression-free survival in combination with chlorambucil in patients with CLL. And so it's possible that the future of using anti-CD20s will be these modified antibodies that have this enhanced uh, uh, capability with antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity uh, that have proven effective in potentially improving response rates. So uh, to talk about the study, this is a randomized phase three study uh, with um, evaluating the potential for increased progression-free survival as well as overall response rates by adding the anti-CD20 antibody ublituximab to ibrutinib in high-risk patients with relapsed refractory CLL. Uh, all these patients were uh, high-risk by definition of deletion 17P, deletion 11Q, or P53 mutations. Uh, and important to note, initially this was a registrational trial with, primary, uh, with PFS as a primary endpoint, but due to slow accrual, uh, that endpoint was changed to overall response rate, which has limited its ability to be a registrational trial for full FDA approval, uh, but there is a potential still for accelerated approval based on overall response rate in this very high-risk group. So to talk about the study and the highlights from ASH, uh, 126 patients were randomized and 117 patients were actually treated. In terms of the cytogenetic abnormalities, the groups were well balanced um, and, and there was no seemingly imbalance in, in terms of patients that were accrued to each arm. Combination therapy was well tolerated with grade three to, and, and uh, ublituximab seems to be safe with grade three and four infusion uh, related reactions only uh, recorded at about 5% of patients. Uh, neutropenia was also well balanced between the patients. Uh, that is one of the issues with uh, uh, obinutuzumab and some of these other anti-CD20 antibodies in that they can induce higher rates of neutropenia, but this was not seen in that there were similar rates of neutropenia between the combination arm versus ibrutinib monotherapy. 
And the median follow-up of 12 at 12 months uh, at time of reporting, the best overall response rate was 80% for ublituximab ibrutinib compared to 47% with ibrutinib alone. And it, this 12-month time point in this high-risk relapse refractory patient population, the complete response rate was 7% versus 0% for um, uh, patients with uh, ibrutinib. Uh, alone, and 19% of patients in the combination arm had MRD negativity in the blood compared to only around 2% or so uh, with ibrutinib monotherapy. Uh, at time of uh, data cut and presentation, there was not a progression-free survival benefit, though there was seemingly was a trend towards uh, improvement in PFS with a hazard ratio, ratio of 0.56 favoring uh, the um, a combination ublituximab plus ibrutinib arms. Um, however, that was not statistically significant and potential with uh, longer term follow-up, we may see uh, um, a PFS benefit. Importantly, the addition of the antibody did not seem to alter the safety of ibrutinib or new safety signals come out outside of uh, needing to have to deal with the infusion-related reactions. Um, and so, uh, this, is draw, this is an important combination because we have, uh, there has been data reported demonstrating the lack of improved progression-free survival in combination therapy with ibrutinib and rituximab. Um, and so it will be interesting to see if the improved overall response rates in this very high-risk re relapse refractory patient population, if with longer follow-up there is a PFS benefit um, that, that starts to sort out because we have yet to prove uh, that addition of anti-CD20 therapy to um, to uh, novel agents has necessarily improved long-term outcomes. It does seem to improve overall response rates, but not necessarily these long-term outcomes that we're very uh, excited about and, and are very important to our patients. For the next study, I'll talk about uh, a recent presentation at ASH as well that highlights some of the combination treatments that we're starting to use for our patients with ibrutinib and venetoclax. And so I'm going to highlight uh, a presentation by Dr. Hillman uh, on the what is called the uh, Bloodwise TAP Clarity Study, uh, which this was some of the initial results of ibrutinib plus venetoclax, a phase two study in relapse refractory high risk CLL. Importantly, this is one of the first studies that has been reported with this combination, and the goal uh, was to utilize the unique properties of each drug. Uh, to see if combination of the two drugs can improve uh, response rates as well as deepen response rates and, and get MRD negativity. Uh, ibrutinib, as we know, uh, is very effective at controlling disease for a long period of time, but it does not rapidly eliminate the CLL cell, whereas venetoclax uh, causes rapid elimination of the CLL cell and can achieve MRD negativity as monotherapy. So the hope is to use both drugs together uh, in a debulking strategy to make the tumor lysis risk of venetoclax less uh, and to uh, um, um, capitalize on the synergy between the two drugs uh, from preclinical studies. So in this study that was reported by Dr. Hellman in, in December, a total of 50 patients had been enrolled. They were all high risk patients uh, as defined uh, by being relapse refractory within three months of, uh, uh, within three years of chemotherapy and or uh, having 17P deletion and have failed prior therapy. The primary endpoint of this study was MRD eradication after 12 months of combination treatment. And then secondary endpoints were uh, MRD eradication at six months and at 24 months. Importantly, Dr. Hillman has shown that uh, the, uh, and, and, and the other aspect of the study and, and where we want to get with novel agents is potentially having finite duration of treatment. And Dr. Hillman has previously shown with some earlier studies of his that um, it depends on the time. Uh, we, we think that you might have to be on drug for a period of time depending on how fast it takes you to get to MRD negativity. So another component of this study is assessing that and that all patients will continue on therapy 12 months after the time that it takes them to get to MRD negativity. Um, and so um, 
uh, it's not necessarily stopping drug at time of MRD negativity, but rather continuing drug to deepen response beyond MRD negativity in order to potentially get long-term remissions. So at the time of reporting of those 50 patients, over half of them had reached eight months of treatment of, uh, of combination therapy. And what it was noted is that 100% of patients had a response rate. Uh, with uh, close to 60% of patients achieving a complete remission or a complete remission with incomplete recovery. The remaining patients had uh, residual, uh, were considered partial responses mainly due to residual lymph nodes that were, you know, small lymph nodes barely greater than 1.5 centimeters. And so these patients are, 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 by radiographic criteria, considered partial responses. So after six months, 28% uh, at that six month time point, 28% of patients uh, uh, um, uh, that were enrolled in the study had achieved an MRD negativity in the bone marrow. Um, and, and the combination was safe in terms of grade three and four uh, adverse events and toxicities, and mainly were related to neutropenia. There's only 43 events recorded, 19 of them were due to neutropenia. Um, and this is something that we see uh, with venetoclax and something that we might be seeing pot potentially more so in combination treatment with ibrutinib. Uh, so these are uh, encouraging and, and un unprecedented results, obviously, for a combination therapy of novel agents uh, for MRD negativity in the bone marrow, uh, especially in the patient population that was being treated in these high-risk relapse refractory patients. Uh, as I said, patients are still on therapy and they will continue 12 months post, post the time it takes them to get to MRD negativity. And uh, importantly, the same combination is currently being looked at in frontline patients um, with, uh, uh, with three cohorts in, in PCYC1142. So this will be in a very informative study in that um, it will identify, one, the efficacy of the combination, two, the safety of the combination, and three, uh, the design of the co three cohorts will look at stopping patients uh, um, uh, potentially at time of MRD negativity versus continuing on treatment, with the third cohort of patients looking at fixed duration of therapy. And so we look forward to those results in the, in the near future and the, over the next year or so, we might be seeing preliminary results. For the last study that I'd like to talk about, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the recent publication of the five-year data with ibrutinib monotherapy. Uh, why this is, this is important is because it highlights the effectiveness of the drug in, in a very high-risk relapse refractory patients, as well as the safety of the drug, uh, and, and um, uh, demonstrate just you know how much of a, a game change this has been in the field of treating patients with CLL. So Dr. O'Brien previously uh, updated preliminary results of this five-year uh, data at, uh, at ASH of 2016 uh, with a recent publication this month in Blood. And this study, uh, this publication highlights two clinical trials, the early phase two studies of monotherapy, really the first large uh, expanded phase two studies of monotherapy of ibrutinib in relapse refractory patients. So these were uh, some of the very first patients to get exposed to the drug, um, of which they were very high risk and did not have many options at the time that they were enrolling. So uh, this study enrolled 132 patients across two studies essentially. Uh, 1102 was in relapse refractory patients and 1103 enrolled 31 patients that were treatment naive. And so 132 patients have now been followed out at five years. A third of these patients in the relapse refractory cohort were high risk by definition of cytogenetics with uh, well over a third of them having 17P deletion, uh, deletion 11Q or complex karyotype. And importantly, when you look at how long patients were on drug in the treatment naive cohort, the current median uh, uh, time on drug was 65 months, so um, uh, over five years, with 77% of those patients treated greater than four years. In the relapse refractory, obviously higher risk patients, um, it was about 39 months with almost 40% of patients uh, being on the drug greater than four years. And this is obviously unprecedented in this patient population where many of these patients may have had six months or one year to live at that time uh, before getting this drug. 
The most common reason that was noted for discontinuation in the relapse refractory cohort was disease progression with 33% of patients progressing. And in that patient population, only uh, about 21% of them uh, came off due to adverse events. Uh, in the treatment naive and relapse refractory groups, the most common grade three or greater adverse events that started to come out with long-term follow-up was hypertension, pneumonia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. And importantly, AFib occurred in about 10% of patients, both e relatively equally in treatment naive or uh, relapse refractory patients. Uh, another side effect of ibrutinib is bleeding. Uh, it, it inhibits our platelets by inhibition of other of BTK as well as other TEC kinases within platelets. And so bleeding and bruising is a problem with the drug, uh, but uh, importantly, only uh, significant hemorrhage was seen in less than 10% of patients with only about 9% of patients having a major hemorrhage over this time span. When you look at responses, overall response rate was 87 and 89% respectively in the treatment naive and relapse refractory cohorts with median duration of response of 72 months in patients uh, in the treatment naive cohort with a duration of response of 57 months in the relapse refractory. It's noted that complete remission rates improved uh, in patients uh, over time with 30% of the treatment naive patients achieving a CR. Um, and median PFS has not been reached in the treatment naive cohort. When you look at the relapse refractory patients, um, uh, these high risk patients, there does seem to be a patient population and represents an unmet need in CLL, and that is our high risk 17P deleted patients. Uh, the estimated five year progression free survival for these patients with 17P deleted. Uh, was about 19.4% uh, 19 in that relapse refractory 17P deleted patient and 74.4% uh, in the treatment naive cohort. In the treatment naive cohort, it's important to note there's only 31 patients and there was relatively few patients with P53 uh, comparatively, but uh, importantly, it still highlights that this is an unmet need in CLL and where we need to direct focus on combination therapies and no, new, new drugs that can eliminate uh, P53 deleted disease. Uh, overall, in the elderly cohort, the estimated five-year progression-free survival and overall survival uh, was uh, in the relapse refractory CLL was 64.8% and 71.6% respectively. So 70% of patients are still alive five years in a relapse refractory cohort. And 64% of them had not even progressed. And it was really these high-risk patients that had progressed that had come off that represent the majority of those patients at that five-year mark. Um, long term of uh, so ultimately the um, uh, ultimately the end point of this and the take home point of the the drug is that ibrutinib is well tolerated, uh, provided durable responses, and obviously has changed the to the face of how we treat our patients with CLL. And it's going to be interesting to see over the next several years uh, how novel combinations um, change the the field and in such a rapidly evolving field. So I thank you for your time for this Velocity vlog, and um, um, have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye.